It's no secret that modern North American homes have a reputation for being cheap, flimsy, and mass-produced, especially with regard to many parts of Europe where masonry and heavy timber has been the language of construction for several millennia. Now there's practical and historic reasons for this, as we have an abundance of forests and lumber in North America, and it's been our building tradition in much of the country for a couple hundred years, but the Europeans do have a point. But that's not to say that we don't have our fair share of homes and buildings that have lasted several hundred years. Now obviously general maintenance continuous usage, better building materials, and smart building practices are big factors in why these buildings have lasted. But what's the common theme here? There's plenty of run-down, deteriorating masonry buildings in Europe. What makes the ones that have lasted so successful? A few months ago, I went to Newport, Rhode Island, the land of the Vanderbilt mansions and the Gilded Age palaces, and apart from the magnificent architecture and the abundant opulence, there's something to be said about how these buildings were constructed that enabled them to withstand over a century of weathering and usage, and still look as magnificent as they looked in the 19th century. And most of these mansions look as if they were shipped straight from Europe itself. We've got masonry or concrete structures, steel framing or reinforcing, and non-combustible cladding materials like marble, stucco, limestone, or terra terracotta tiles. Interiors varied, but were mostly composed of plaster work, ornately carved solid wood ornamentation, and polished marble or granite. Not a lot of moisture sensitive materials. It also helps that these are mass buildings, and that they can soak up and redistribute a lot of water without any issues in a process called hygric redistribution. The abundant amount of heat flow also helped to keep these buildings nice and dry. We can also turn to the old world and look to the buildings and monuments of Europe. I mean, just take a look at any major city in Europe and you can easily find buildings in excellent condition that predate the founding of the United States. Well, at least the ones that survived the two world wars, but again, these buildings are taken care of and they have been in constant use, which means that they've been continuously maintained, but their durable construction techniques and historic value have prevented them from being torn down in the first place. So what's going on here? Apart from building maintenance, what's making these durable buildings so successful? Well, let's talk about the damage functions that act on a building. First on our list, we've got fire. Fire has completely razed cities. I'm sure most people are familiar with the Great Fire of London in 1666, or the fires that raged in San Francisco after the devastating earthquake in 1906. The ancient city of Rome often caught on fire, and so construction techniques, materials, and building codes were developed to address fire, and nowadays we're pretty good at it. So our buildings need to manage fire effectively if we want them to last. The next damage function that our building needs to address is water. Water wreaks havoc on buildings whether they're constructed of wood, masonry, concrete, or steel. Wood buildings rot, masonry buildings deteriorate from spalling and redistribute that moisture to materials and components that are in direct contact with it. Concrete is more resistant to water damage, but again, it'll redistribute that moisture inwards to your moisture sensitive components. And of course, steel rusts and we get corrosion. So we want to keep our structural components as dry as possible and close to interior conditions. Now there's plenty of ways that buildings can get wet. It's not just through bulk water leaks and bad flashing practices, as condensation from air leakage and overventilation can also be a major cause of moisture related issues in many building assemblies. What else do we need to protect our buildings from? Ultraviolet light and heat. Ultraviolet light from the sun is extremely damaging to many building materials, especially waterproofing materials, plastics, and paints. Just like how ultraviolet light gives us a sunburn, our building materials can get a sunburn as well, causing them to lose their ability to resist water. As in the case of membrane materials, we tend to see the plasticizers migrate out of the membrane or break down, making them brittle. Not only that, but heat can warp these materials and cause them to degrade. For every 10 degrees Celsius or 18 degree Fahrenheit rise in temperature above the optimal performance temperature, the rate of deterioration roughly doubles each time, meaning that the rate of degradation is exponential, especially when challenged with water and heat. We also need to protect our buildings from pests like termites, carpenter ants, and other vermin. While the physics are relatively simple to design for, bugs and pests can cause serious damage to our buildings, especially wood structures. They can burrow into our insulation materials, and they can be detrimental to the integrity of our homes, our health, and our peace of mind. And so if we want our buildings to last a long time, we have to make sure that we're considering this as a factor. Protect the building from those things, and the building components will last well past their expected service life. All right, so now that we've established the damage functions that are acting on the building, how do we design a wall that addresses all of these issues and gives the best chance of long-term durability and performance? This is the perfect wall. We've talked about this wall assembly a few times before on this channel, but this assembly was pioneered by Joe Stebrick from Building Science Corporation. 
The idea behind this wall is that we have all of the control layers located on the outside of the structure to protect it from moisture and mechanical damage and to provide the greatest level of thermal performance. We install the water, air, and vapor control layer first over the structure. This can take the form of a self-adhering membrane or a fluid applied system, but essentially we want something that bonds to the structure so that water and air can't leak through. Now, depending on the specs of the wall assembly and the cladding materials, we may want to limit the amount of vapor passing through to prevent elevated relative humidity levels, but generally we don't really have to worry so much about vapor in this assembly, except for inwardly driven vapor which we can manage fairly easily by specifying a membrane with a slightly lower perm rating. For those who are wondering, a perm rating is essentially the measurement that we use to determine the vapor permeance of a membrane material. A perm rating of 5 to 10 perms would work just fine here. Then we have our thermal control layer. The thermal control is our insulation layer, and we want to use a moisture resistant rigid insulation product. And this exterior rigid insulation will provide a thermal break between the exterior environment and the conductive structural components. It'll also protect the water and air control layer from damage, keeping it closer to interior temperatures. The wall assembly is also able to dry unimpeded to the interior by locating all of the insulation outboard. Finally, we have a ventilated cladding, and this cladding is intended to protect the control layers behind it. This can take the form of siding, stucco, brick veneer, metal panels, or any other material that you could use as a wall covering. Now, there are plenty of variations of the perfect wall, but if I wanted to design a wall assembly that could last for 500 years and resist the damage functions that we discussed earlier, this is the wall assembly that I would build. Just like the buildings of antiquity and up through the early modern period, we're starting with a masonry wall, but instead of bricks, we're using reinforced CMU. Grouted CMU, or concrete masonry units, are essentially the modern equivalent of a multi-wythe mass masonry wall. They're widely used in the construction industry around the world, both for structural and fill walls, and they're extremely strong, durable, and non-combustible, and they won't rot. Bugs don't eat concrete, and so we don't need to worry about things like termites and carpenter ants, except if we were to finish the interior with wood paneling and millwork. Then we have a fluid applied water and air control layer installed over the exterior face of the CMU. While CMU has many durability benefits, it's not waterproof by any means, and will readily absorb moisture if we don't provide a capillary break or some sort of water repellent coating. Now for my friends in Europe, you don't actually see them coating the surface with anything. They just install the rigid insulation directly against the block wall because there's an assumption that the rigid insulation installed outboard combined with the air gap will prevent water from bridging to that block wall. And while this is partially true, we do tend to see tons of water finding a path behind there around windows and doors, pipe penetrations, and masonry ties. And so it's important that we're building in some redundancy into this design. The fluid apply coating will also provide an air barrier in the assembly, as well as a vapor retarder. While CMU is very solid, it can crack, and not all of the cells are grouted solid, and so we can get air leakage if we don't provide this fluid applied water and air control layer. For our rigid insulation, we're using a couple of layers of rigid mineral wool insulation. Mineral wool is non-combustible and hydrophobic. It doesn't rot, it's vapor permeable, and bugs don't eat it, as they have a difficult time burrowing into it, and it has a very stable R value throughout its service life. It doesn't deteriorate when exposed to UV light, and so it's very difficult to beat mineral wool as a rigid insulation material if you want something that'll last a long time. Then we have a ventilated brick cladding that's attached through the rigid insulation into the CMU wall with masonry ties. Much like in the tradition of many older buildings, this brick cladding will protect all of the control layers behind it from damage, as it's highly durable and has a proven track record of performance. Now because the brick is a reservoir cladding, we do want to consider coating the brick in a vapor permeable silane or siloxane penetrating sealer to reduce surface absorption, as we want to limit the amount of inward vapor drive into that wall. With this in mind, we're using mineral wool as our rigid insulation material, and this means that the fluid applied water and air control layer should be designed with a lower perm rating of around 10 perms to throttle inward vapor flow, since that mineral wool is highly vapor open. If we were to use rigid foam instead of mineral wool, this could serve that function as a vapor retarder. Guys, this is my version of the perfect wall if I wanted to build something that could last for 500 years or longer. Obviously maintenance and continual usage is a big factor, as well as general best practice water management, but this is very much inspired by the older, more traditional building practices, and we actually see versions of this wall assembly being built all around the world, especially in commercial structures. We're just providing some more redundancy and using materials in a different way to improve on the design. Now, this perfect wall isn't cheap by any means, which is why there's other ways that have been developed to achieve achieve similar performance, but the goal of this video was to show you the best of the best. We can build this wall using rigid foam and aluminum cladding if mineral wool and brick veneer is too expensive. We can build this wall using lightwood framing if CMU is out of the budget or logistically difficult to construct. 
We can use CLT or cross laminated timber instead of light wood framing. We can use light gauge steel, dense glass, gold, and poly ISO. There are countless variations of this wall that can be designed to perform exceptionally. Now, I want to give a big shout out to Building Science Corporation and Joe Stebrick for popularizing this whole concept of the perfect wall and their dedication to durability and building performance. If you found this video helpful, make sure to leave a like and subscribe for more weekly building science videos. And head over to our website at asiri-designs.com where we have over 150 free building science articles that cover a wide range of topics, including how to design these high-performance wall assemblies, retrofitting existing buildings, general moisture control, and more. Links will be in the description below. Good luck with your projects. Cheers.